Circumcision is our being placed into Christ, our inner man, our heart has been circumcised from the flesh by the Holy Spirit's application of the death and resurrection of Christ so that our spiritual inner life is from Christ in heaven on whom we have set the gaze of our hearts by faith. And so there is this work that the Spirit of God has done at our conversion to apply the death and resurrection to us in such a way that a circumcision of the inner man from the outer person, the outer man, has taken place. The consequence is that you no longer have to obey the sin that is embedded in your outer man and you are connected to the life of God and therefore the power of God to live in the Spirit, to walk by the Spirit, and to produce the fruit of the Spirit, because we are in that realm. Again, this is not not terribly common. Um, John Stott, in his commentary on Colossians, does a good job. This is one of the places where I can commend Watchman Nee to you. Watchman Nee does a good job at this in several of his um, several of his books. You do have to be careful with Watchman Nee, particularly toward the latter part of his life, where he was writing from prison and seemed at times to lose lose some perspective. And, uh, but I'm, I'm hesitant to criticize Watchman Nee wrote about a third of his books on toilet paper in prison, snuck out by guards. They kept assigning him guards and his testimony to them. They kept getting converted. Finally took him out and cut his tongue out and nailed it to a, to a tree out in the yard. And uh, so he would give them the writings. They would sneak them out. And uh, he was released from prison and disappeared. We do not know what happened to him. And um, so he's one of those godly men who, in incredible circumstances, simply tried to faithfully serve the Lord according to his light. And uh, sometimes that light was clear and bright and helpful, and occasionally that light, we needed to, uh, we needed to clean the, uh, I don't know the English word, the glass that goes around a, uh, a light and so um, but thinking about this topic but it, it, it's so clear here in Colossians that by faith we believe this to be true and when we believe it to be true then it has very powerful effect in our lives and uh, as I've expressed over Romans 6, 7 and 8 over Colossians 2 Um, 2 Corinthians 3, that the fact that these texts are not generally known, and sometimes when they are known, they are misunderstood, is deeply concerning because they are so fundamental to how we live as Christians. And believing these things then has entailments. It has things that that come with them. Now I'm going to take just a moment to review, and I'm just going to put this all up. Here was the instruction that we received in Christ's centrality. And this whole idea of heart circumcision is centered on, focused on, um, on the centrality of Christ. So before we we take up our exposition, I'm going to ask uh, Rex, would you you mind standing and just leading us in a brief prayer to the throne of grace, asking God to help us as we take up his word. So Paul in chapter three and verse um, in chapter two and verse eight, um, working to it, then our responsibilities in Christ were not to be ensnared by false wisdoms. We were to recognize the source of error is embedded or coming out of the world or the world's philosophies, or 
traditions taught as religion, whether it's Christian religion, Judaism, or so on. And then we're to affirm the standard for truth. The standard for truth is in Christ, and it's particularly in this case, it's in the Incarnation. And uh, in the Incarnation, Jesus is God and man. He is deity in a real human body. And so he had no need of circumcision, of spiritual circumcision, because he lived a life in the Incarnation where his inner man and his outer man lived as they ought to be, not with sin controlling, but rather with the Spirit controlling and, uh, and so on. And then, um, then he, he teaches us our fullness in Christ. All of God is in Christ bodily. And we are indwelt by Christ. And so there is this indwelt by God through the Spirit while we are in Christ. And the key to all of this is that we are in Christ. That we have been placed into Him. We have been joined to Him by the work of the Spirit. And our being placed into Him means that the Spirit then has applied the work of Christ in the cross, the death and the resurrection of Christ, has been applied to us so that what Jesus did on the cross is actually true of us. Now there's some not yet to some of that. We have the inbreaking of the new creation in the inner man in that the Spirit has come in. But we don't have our glorified bodies yet. So there's an already and not yet aspect to this. And then when the Spirit came into us, then we were circumcised, as Paul says, by a circumcision not made with hands. And that is so that there is this dividing, this, this, all that circumcision did in the Old Testament, one of its primary new covenant lessons is for us to grasp what this means. And, um, and why, part, and what, it had two reasons. It was very important because of this new covenant trajectory. It was also very in, important because then you knew who was the possessor of the land. This is why only males were circumcised. And because then we knew who was in the covenant and therefore the land that had been granted to each tribe, to each um, family and so on. So that could not be corrupted and could not be and uh, the end effect then is, is that we know who owns, who is, who is our participant in the new creation, the heavenly land, because we have received the circumcision of the Spirit, which becomes a, one of the great marks of who true believers really are. And so, and so this is all effected by our resurrection in Christ, that we have a new life that raises us out of our spiritual deadness, we have forgiveness of our trespasses, therefore we are freed from guilt, and he has canceled the debt that we had incurred by the legal demands under the law. And so we have a new life, we are no longer dead in sin, but rather we are alive in Christ. We have been forgiven our trespasses, the record of trespasses that we had committed, both as a result of, our, um, of our, the imputed guilt of Adam, as well as our personal acts of sin. All of that sin has been forgiven. It, has been, it is no longer being held to our account because Jesus has satisfied and paid it all. And then that, that debt that which came about because of the legal demands of God's law, that has been satisfied as well. And so the price that was required has been paid in the outpoured life of Christ. The penalty that was required, Jesus has suffered. That is, the penalty was death, was both physical and spiritual death, and Jesus suffered it for us. And the result then is that he has made provision so that we are no longer, not only under the law, we are no longer under the curse of the law, the judgment of the law. We do not stand before God, before the law. God is no longer the judge of believers because Jesus has stood and taken it all. Our relationship with God is as Father. And that becomes the incentive 
insistence of Paul. And Paul's saying, we go back to Abraham because we have a father who has promised us all these things in his covenant. We do not go back to Moses because that takes us back to law. It puts us back in front of a judge. And therefore, any violation of any transgression is a transgression of the whole thing. And praise God, we have been delivered from that. And we have been set free to a higher law. It's not we've been set free to live any way we want, but we've been set free to the kind of things that we heard this morning in the Sermon on the Mount. But then, there in this, there are some... And one of the things that in this, in the resurrection, that he disarmed our spiritual enemies and he empowered victory over them. And so that... Occasionally comes up in Paul that's a little bit difficult, a little bit. There is this spiritual warfare that is going on behind the scenes in which our involvement seems to be fairly minimal. And um, we need to be very careful, and yet there is a real sense, and where, particularly where the gospel has not gone, that there is a real sense in which the spiritual powers of darkness often hold sway. And I could. I could tell stories of where I grew up in Africa, some of the things I've seen in, in the Far East, in China and India, and what I have seen in, back in Africa, in Namibia, and so on. So then from this, though, Paul gives us some imperatives. And as we pick up then in verse 16, since these things are true... Therefore, all right, so because of all that Paul has taught us keyed around our circumcision in the Spirit and what Christ has done in settling the requirements of the law, then let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism, the worship of angels, going in in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Now, notice then that Paul says that we are not to allow people to judge us based on, in other words, we are not to agree with their judgments. This doesn't mean you get into big arguments and saying you're judging me and so on. The sense here is don't agree with others who pass judgment on you based on things in the Old Testament law. And then he lists some things, a festival, a new moon, a Sabbath, questions of food or drink, these, these are all things that come out of the Old Testament law. How do I know that? Because pagan rituals had festivals. They had um, um, dietary requirements and, and so on. Well, because of verse 17. These, referring to what has gone before, are a shadow. Now that's Pauline language. It's New Testament language. It's he book of Hebrews language. That the shadow are... The Old Testament, particularly the Mosaic Law, it's the Old Covenant. They are the shadow. But the substance, the reality, is Christ. And so we don't go back to the shadows for how we live, but rather we look to Christ and to how we live and what the New Covenant, what the New Testament has taught us. And so don't agree with others' judgment in trying to bring you back under this realm. Now this was, you know, for us sometimes, we, this is narrow, sort of in a way, because most of us did not grow up as Jews in which we celebrated the Sabbath, which we kept 
um, monthly or annual feasts. That's, that's really not, not part of our experience. But it certainly would have been the experience of any faithful Jew who had now come to Christ. I mean, this is his culture. And Paul says, don't allow, and particularly speaking to the Gentiles, don't let people who grew up like this and have not yet appreciated their freedom in Christ, don't let them, don't agree with their judgment that you ought to live this way. And um, so, so don't try to live by the old covenant. Um, I'm not going to get into the discussion as to whether or not all of this is about the Old Covenant, but um, so in verses um, 16 through 17, do not allow others to judge you. The idea being here, do not allow, uh, do not agree with the, their assessment. Do not, do not um, enter into their judgment. And then in verse 18, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism, worship angels, and so on. Now here, what is happening is that coming out of both Judaism and all of the mystery religions and the mysticism that surrounded the Colossian Christians as well as most of the Roman world, there was this push to, in, in some circles, to... Um, to a higher spirituality. There was the normal Christian life, and then there's a higher spirituality where you you deny the body and you you have you you worship in these spiritual beings and you go on about visions. And then in a curious turn, Paul says, when you do this, this is a kind of going on about your you know, this is a sensuous mind. It is a person who is overtaken with and desiring to, you know, to have a, a, a tangible Christianity that then pursues these. It, it's sort of, it's a little bit of a poke, right? You want to worship angels? You want to be an ascetic? You want to go on about your visions and dreams? He says all that is is just another expression of being sensuous. And... Um, and he says, don't let people disqualify you from being a true maturing believer. And this may have some impact on disqualifying for office within the church. It's kind of an unusual word. But don't, let in, don't, uh, don't agree with anyone's assessment that you are a substandard Christian if you haven't had these kinds of super spiritual experiences. Why? Well, because what makes you spiritual isn't these kinds of things. What makes you spiritual is the presence of the Spirit in you who has cut you, separated you from the power of the flesh, that is what makes you spiritual. And so the Bible doesn't talk about higher or lower spirituality as a general rule. Most of the time the Bible talks about maturity and growth and stability. It uses other words. Why? Because we who are any believer, any true believer is spiritual in that sense, in the New Testament sense. Now there's a couple of exceptions to that, but as a general rule, that's how he addresses it. And so this idea here of, of the fact that we, we, we don't want to pursue all of these super spiritual things that, that become some way of measuring an elevated spirituality. Why? Well, what's the danger? What's the danger in the text? What, what is happening to people who do that? They're not holding fast to the head. In other words, they have let loose of the centrality of Christ, which he has just taught, 
And now they are pushing other things into the center of what it means to live the Christian life. And so the Christian life is either lived on one downslope by going back under law and therefore keeping of the law, or it goes down another slope to where it becomes this kind of esoteric, super spirituality associated with asceticism, and so on. Now, never happens in the modern day, right? And, you know, some of us, including me, have journeyed through those down slopes. And I'm very thankful for the grace of God to see in the Scriptures, to be discipled by men who challenge some of my thinking, and some living men and some men just through their writings. And so don't allow others to try to live, get you to live by extra-biblical revelation whether that extra-biblical revelation is super-spiritual or whether it is the common traditions, teachings, philosophies, and so on from the world. But rather, we must hold fast to Christ. Why? Well, because He is the source of our growth. Do you see that? Um, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. And so together, the church is growing in knowledge and maturity and understanding, which we have seen down through history. Not only is there progressive revelation of the Scriptures, but I believe there has been progressive illumination of the Scriptures. It is, it is, it is manifestly true that we are, understand way more about the Bible than people understood in the early church. Now, it, with the exception possibly of the apostles, but in the years after the first 100, 200, 300 years, you figure by, by 300, I mean, they had given up the authority of the church to Constantine. Really? And, and then that afflicted the church until the 1300s. Thousand years of darkness, growing darkness because of, of something that was given up. Well, enough church history for the moment. Um, but my, my point here is, is that we, we, we not only are growing, um, and the tendency here is to focus on, well, this is how you grow spiritually and individually, and once again, our Western individualism and our siloed Christianity. And our growth and your individual growth is tied to and connected to not only your vertical holding fast to the head, but your being in a corporate community that is growing in understanding because the larger body of Christ down through history of which you are a part is also growing as it stays connected to the head. Now I know this is, the, you know, Christians are all the time looking at me and, and the, when I get into this stuff they say, okay Russ, but just tell me what to do. I, I, I want, I, you know, tomorrow do I call in even, you know, because the snow is coming? Is that, a, is, that an, you know, is that an integrity thing? What do I do? You know, and, and I kind of shrug my shoulders and say, I don't care. <laughs> it's a wisdom issue. Choose what's best. Because, because we're, we're, trying to, we're, try, we're thinking that, that when we have all of these sort of check boxes, and if we check all the boxes off, then somehow we're okay with God. And some would say, this might be an overstatement, the existence of the check boxes themselves makes you not okay with God. That's probably an overstatement, but... So then he goes on in verse 20 and tells us not to live by human regulations. Here comes the check boxes.
If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why is if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to the things that are all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. Now these all have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion, asceticism, and severity to the body. But they are of limited value. Oh, excuse me. What does it say? Do you believe that? They are of no value in stopping the indulgences of the flesh. That's shocking. Now some of you have been around here long enough to have heard me kick this bucket several times. But most Christians don't believe that phrase. They just don't. You can see it functionally. But notice the condition that's in the text. Do not try to live by human regulations. Why? Because rules living is from the world to which you have died. Living by rules was necessary in the world and in the old covenant. Again, we're not saying Moses was wrong. The law is sinful. The law was in some way. It's just that at that time in progressive revelation, that's what God taught us. That's what God showed them. That's what they were to live by. And the effect was is that all of this rules and law for a thoughtful believer was, I can't do this can't live this way. And therefore God provided the sacrifices that could be brought that anticipated the sacrifice of Christ. But then there's all the rules living that doesn't come from the moral law or from the Mosaic law or even from the larger old covenant. But then there's a kind of rules living that just comes from the world. Right? Seven rules for Christian living. I, I, when, I, I don't go to religious bookstores anymore. I, I, in fact, they practically disappeared. There, there aren't very many of them. But one of the interesting things to me was that, you know, you, you, your theology sections are about like this, and your commentaries may be a little bit bigger, but then you go to the sections on how to live the Christian life. And so family, five shelves, you know, all of that kind of thing. And it was almost all good advice. None of it that I could ever find that was talk, talked about these kind of texts, you know. And, and, and the problem is, is that we're trying to fill in where we think the Bible has sort of left us wondering. You know, this is, this, is, this is God's gift to publishers. He didn't say much about this. And um, it's because we're, we're, there's so many reasons. But one of the reasons is because we're trying to create some other means to live the Christian life than what the Bible has provided for. If further, we're trying to set standards for the Christian life that the Holy Spirit is not empowering us for. Now, notice this. If, um, and, and notice the result, the, the, the rationale is, if you died with Christ... Why in the world do you still live by regulations? Why does he say that? Well, because he recognizes that having died with Christ, you are living in a different realm. You have been raised with him. And I, I keep coming back to this, keep coming back to this, keep coming, because I, I, I want you to remember it. I want you to think about it. I want you to believe it. So rules living is from the world to which you have died. Rules living is useless against the indulgence of the flesh. 
I taught this someplace in a in a conference, and we were going through some the, the basics of the Christian life. So it was Romans six, seven, and eight, Colossians two, two Corinthians three, Romans twelve, one and following. Um, do not allow yourself to be poured in the world's mold as a result of having presented yourself as a as a sacrifice that is alive. What a what a great phrase! And um, so. And I came to this, and um, I read it in the English. It was read in the language of the country I was speaking in. And I said, so do you believe this? And two or three older pastors who ought to have known later said, no, it's not true. Wait a minute. <laughs> Excuse me. Can you tell me, what does that actually translate what your language, translate what it says in your language right back to me? What does it say? He said, well, it says they are of no value in keeping us from being dominated by the flesh. Okay. Not exactly what it says in the original, but... And I, I kind of chuckled because at some level, they just said what probably most of the, of the older pastors in the room were actually thinking. They, they didn't let it fall out of their mouth, but they were certainly thinking it. Well, you know, our rules are different than what Paul is talking about. Um, and so on. Now, why are these things often accepted? Right in the text. Paul tells us. Why do, why do people go along with this stuff? Appeals to the flesh. That's one. What's the other reason? It looks wise. So it's both of these, isn't it? It's weird. We try to live the Christian life to overcome the flesh by doing things that appeal to the flesh. Wonderful. How's that going to work? And then we're, we're dazzled by it. It appears to be wise. Ooh, I never thought about that. And as a result then, we are deflected and taken off what will actually cause us to live in a way that God wants us to live. And so we do live by faith in the truths of the gospel. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. If then you have been raised. Now you see how this is connected? This is a horrible, horrible, horrible chapter break. Because verse 20, if with Christ you died, chapter 3 verse 1, if then you have been raised with Christ. So guess what? <laughs> these, are, these are very, very connected. If then you have been raised with Christ, here's what you ought to do. Here's the way to live the Christian life. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. But that is so impractical. Because I want to know when the speed limit is 35, do I have to do 35? There's a German saying that says something to the effect, you know, when you're behind, you always get stuck behind somebody doing the speed limit. Go figure that out later. But if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Secondly, set your minds. These are imperatives, brothers and sisters. These are not suggestions. This is not good advice. Here are the true how-tos of the Christian life. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is your life appears, you will also appear to, with him in glory. Meaning in a glorified state. Not, not meaning in glory where we often equate that with heaven. That's, that's not what he's saying. Okay. So how does this work? First, set your, your priorities Pursue, go after, make it your purpose in life, those things that are heavenly. You see that? That's the first thing. Think about, pursue God's goals and agenda that come from a resurrected, ascended, enthroned 
Lord. Um, think of the Lord's prayer, the Lord's pattern of prayer. And so, uh, may your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. What does that mean? Well, it means something similar to this. And so, since we have been raised with Christ and we have a life that is hidden there, and we can't feel, we can't touch, we can't taste, here's true spirituality, then seek the things that are above. You see the pursuit aspect of this? The go after, make it your purpose, make it your aim in life. Not to be driven by what is in the world and the world's goals and the world's drives and everything that's important in the world because you are a living sacrifice. You are a sacrifice that is alive. So seek the things above where Christ is and secondly, set your minds on things above. When you don't have to think about anything, what do you think about? Yeah, a lot of us are shaking our heads, yeah. That's a sad self-diagnosis, isn't it? Set your minds. Why? Well, because you have because you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. You will not do verses 1 and 2 if you do not believe verse 3. You just won't. Here's, here's what is to be believed so that the imperative can be obeyed. And um, when I was first learning these things and wanting to try to live by them in a very legalistic environment, in which I grew up, in which by grace the Lord was beginning to teach me these things in the early part of our marriage, we were still in that environment and were even in our first um, ministry assignment where the Lord took us. And so I would take these texts and put them on three by five cards, but then I would put my name in there. Now it, calls, it meant I had to do a little bit of rewriting, but the point was is that this is not, this is not out there. This is not, this is not just something to know. This was something that was true of Russ Kennedy. So I went through all, went through Romans 6, 7, and 8. I went through Colossians 2. I went through Ephesians 3. And I rewrote those out and I put my name in there. So that when I read those to myself from those cards, there was a sense where I was training my heart, my inner person, to affirm, to confess what is true, to agree with what is true. Now, I'm not saying, good grief, it's not a checkbox to go home right now and make three by five cards and put your name in there, right? I'm, I'm only saying it was a benefit to me, me, and you're still using three by five cards. That's another issue. And then we are to do this until Christ comes. When Christ, who is your life, when he appears, then all of this hidden stuff, your hidden life in Christ, your being seated in Christ, your resurrection in Christ, your genuine spirituality, when he appears, then all of that will be unveiled, is the word here. All of that will be, the, the veil of flesh will be pulled back, as an old, old Puritan song used to say. And we'll all be peeled back. And when Jesus is revealed, there will be a revealing of ourselves as well. And so we patiently pers persevere until the Lord returns. Well, living as a Christian means that our hope is focused on the future realities, which then define us presently. Now, we could keep going because what does the next, what's the next imperative? Verse 5, put to death. Right? Put to death 
what remains, what earthly remains in you, and so on. Um, then um, this begins to work out then into practical Christian living. Don't lie. Tell the truth. Um, of, avoid immorality. You see. And then into verse 12. In these verses which are familiar to us because they are similar to, a, to larger sections of Ephesians. Colossians is sort of like the crib notes on Ephesians. <laughs> it's the short version. Um, written about the same time, written to two different groups, and very, very similar in many, many places. And so, we could keep on going because here are the imperatives. And this is what it looks like. If we, have, if we are pursuing Christ in heaven and we are um, seeking those things and setting our minds on and we are living the crucified life as it once used to be called, then here are some commands. Here are some, here are some imperatives to be believed in an obeying way. Because now we're not cut loose from commands, we're just cut loose from the Old Testament, from the Old Covenant, from the Old Law. And now we are tied to and tethered to the law of Christ that works itself out through the rest of the book of Colossians down to chapter 4 and verse 7. That's how it works. So here's some practical lessons. First, recognize the common substitutes for, for, um, for biblical Christian living. Boy, and there are a lot of them. Almost any time I hear somebody say, here is the key to the Christian life, eek. Um... Then, of course, I say, this is the key to the Christian life. It's not eek. Firm that the common substitutes are not viable alternatives and are, in fact, dangerous to our souls. Why? Well, because they cause us to believe what is not true and often cause us to doubt what is true. And instead of living by faith in what is sometimes really hard to understand... We live by faith in what we can easily grasp, easily measure, easily reproduce. That's what happens. Now, one of the things that, again, I want to come back to and to say again, is that too often people say, I want to understand it so that I can believe it. That is backwards. The Bible says in order to understand something, you have to believe it first. Understanding follows belief. Does not come ahead of it. If you want to understand this, then do what is necessary in your own soul to affirm it, to confess it, to memorize it, to repeat it, both in its negative and its positive, the death side and the resurrection side and as you believe it and as it works itself out in real Christian living then more and more and more you will understand it but if you're going to wait to understand it in order to believe it then you're going to wait to glory more than likely thirdly Seek to live the Christian life by faith, believing all that the Scriptures tell us is true of Christ and of our union to Him. Fourthly, your inner man, your heart, has been cut free from the flesh, praise God. Has been cut free from the world through your union with Christ and your being placed into His death and resurrection. And you must respond to these truths through all the imperatives Paul write. We are actively responding to them. Well, I had another whole thing I was going to go on to. If I start, you're going to really be left hanging. So we'll do that next week. And um, so.